today. This roundtable is the first in series that FTA will host to engage all of you in support of the Biden-Harris administration's goal of achieving a 50% reduction in economy-wide net greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. Along with our transit partners, we have a great opportunity to reach this truly ambitious goal. At today's roundtable, we will highlight the important role of public transit in tackling climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as well as discuss strategy, strategies, opportunities, and op obstacles you may face. We will also share resources and timelines to further engage with you on how the industry can re realistically achieve the administration's greenhouse gas emissions reduction goals to combat climate change. Rest assured, this will be an ongoing effort. Before we get started, let me cover some housekeeping. As part of the registration process, you receive questions in advance of today's session. We will not be taking live questions, but you are welcome to submit your questions and comments throughout the session via the chat box. Just select the Q&A bubble on the right side of your screen to submit your comment. You will review, we will review your questions after today's event to identify any additional information FTA can provide and ways that we can continue to support you. We will be recording this event and posting it on FTA's Climate Considerations webpage. Now, before we provide you with an overview of FTA's current programs and policies that support emissions reduction efforts and introduce today's panelists, it is my pleasure to introduce FTA Administrator Noria Fernandez. With more than 35 years in, transportation, in the transportation industry, Administrator Fernandez is an experienced and inspiring leader. She comes to our agency after serving as the General Manager and CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority for the past seven years, as well as the Chair of the American Public Transportation Association, and we are lucky to have her leading FTA. Administrator Noria Fernandez will discuss the Biden-Harris administration's greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets and how we can work together to achieve the administration's goals. Now, let me turn it over to you, Noria. Thank you very much, Felicia, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. So before I begin, let me just say how grateful I am for all of your steadfast commitment uh, to your riders uh, during the pandemic for showing up to ensure that essential workers could keep moving and to heeding to President Biden's call for us to speed up vaccine uh, distribution. Transit agencies and their workers stepped up to help and I say thank you. Now, we're asking for your help to stem the current trend of our climate crises. Uh, this past April at the International Leaders Summit on Climate, President Biden announced that the United States will be updating its commitment under the Paris Agreement to cut in half U.S. greenhouse gas emissions from 2005 levels by 2030. This target is consistent with the president's goal of achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions economy-wide by no later than 2050. So our transportation system, as all of you know, is part of the problem. In fact, the transportation sector is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States accounting for 29% of all total emissions in 2019. Over 90% of the fuel used in transportation is petroleum-based, uh, primarily gasoline and diesel. So while the transit industry's contribution to emissions is relatively small in comparison to the overall industry, it still plays a part. Uh, in 2019, buses accounted for 1.2% of transportation greenhouse gas emissions, while rail, including freight, accounted for 2.2%. Uh, yet public transportation has perhaps the best opportunity to tackle the climate crises at home and abroad uh, with new technologies that offer a chance to make major greenhouse gas emission cuts. So with that in mind, I am confident that our industry will play a substantial role in reducing GHG emissions to help reach the administration's ambitious targets. And we can all take credit for being at the forefront of transportation sector in cutting the GHG emissions simply by providing good, reliable service, which is a viable alternative to driving 
and reducing vehicle miles travel. You know, back in 2018, transit saved 63 million metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. And that's equivalent of taking 16 coal power plants offline for one year here in the US. So that is major. And today we're gonna to hear from a representative collection of transit agencies that have already taken concrete steps to reduce GHG emissions by beginning to convert their fleets to alternative fuel, purchasing electric vehicles and the associated uh, charging systems, training their frontline transit employees to support and operate alternative fuel vehicles, installing on-site solar power to make their transit facilities more energy efficient and sustainable, and implementing environmental and sustainability management systems to reduce emissions and impacts from facilities and operations. And all this with developing new operational plans and procurements to support climate actions with measures to achieve zero emissions by 2050. So I wanna commend all of you for turning vision into action. The president, a commitment to move this initiative forward, helping support the transit industry through the American Jobs Plan, is proposing to invest billions of dollars to improve the infrastructure with cleaner, greener technologies. And as part of the president's plan, $25 billion will be directed to transformative investments in clean transit vehicles and technologies that will help improve our air quality and the environmental justice. FTA has played a significant role in increasing cleaner fleets through several of our grants programs that uh, help fund electric buses. And many of you I know have received funding to begin the transitioning of your own fleets. Uh, back in 2019, we saw a shift away from diesel powered buses uh, starting to take place when only 42% of buses uh, were diesel powered. That is a market uh, change from 1995 when there was 95% of our transit buses ran on diesel. So, and then the hybrid electric bus market share was increased to 18% from only 1% in 2015, 2005. So you start to see the, the, that the clip and the changes and there's still more to be done. Today, electric buses still make up less than 1% of US bus fleets. This is the formula. If we work together, we share our knowledge and we leverage federal funds and resources, we can curb the GHG emissions while we continue expanding our service to more communities. And in doing so, we'll be creating more jobs and a much healthier community across all America. So I pledge to you that FTA is committed to working with all of you and providing all the tools and resources that we have at our disposal so that we can help meet the administration's emissions reductions goal. And as we do so, we can plan for a most sustainable and resilient transit system. I look forward to continuing this very important conversation and seeing more transit fleets coming green in the next months ahead. But now I would like to introduce my DOT colleague, Andrew Wishnia who is gonna be sharing with you the department's efforts to address climate change to support the GHG emission reduction. Andrew uh, is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Climate Policy. And prior to joining USDOT, he served as the US, at the US Senate Com uh, Committee on Environment and Public Works, including as Senior Policy Advisor and also served at the Federal Highway Administration as a special assistant for policy to the Federal Highway Administrator and a senior program manager at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Thank you for joining us today, Andrew. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much for having me, um, Madam Administrator. This is a really exciting roundtable and an opportunity. And before I begin, I just want to thank so much uh, uh, newly minted FTA Administrator Noria Fernandez's leadership in helping support the secretary and, and president's goal of achieving net zero emissions by 2050 and 50% emission reduction by 2030. Um, thank you as well to the FTA team. Thank you to Subash, to Felicia, to Megan, and to the entire FTA family for helping lead by example on, on climate solutions as, as well. Um, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Policy at DOT is a newly created position by this administration. It's an honor to currently hold the appointment. And it, it's probably a reflection of the fact that the transportation sector now generates the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. 
and what we're trying to solve for at the Department of Transportation. Um, you know, I have a five-year-old now and a five-month-old. And like so many of you, I, I think about really what kind of world I want to leave for them and, and to them. And the good news is that we have a moment right now to make such a transformational difference in the lives of future generations. The, the recently released budget and the President's American Jobs Plan, I think both reflect ambition in delivering not just on top line promises of how much we're delivering for our transportation system, although I think it does that, but, but it also you know, speaks to how we're designing programs to ensure a more equitable future. So in alignment with the President's net zero by 2050 goals, we need to make sure that we're creating options to reduce trips, to shift trips, and to improve trips. And FTA's leadership will, will help in each one of those areas. Um, a, a more just climate future will we'll also promote good paying jobs. And that's good news because there are critical labor and critical workforce opportunities and needs, including retraining the existing workforce. So we look forward to working with our friends in labor toward this end as well. Uh, the American Jobs Plan helps to solve for a lot of the ambitious effort that's needed to create healthier air, healthier communities. And we're looking to spur that same sense of ambition to meet this critical moment that we all face. Um, now I'll turn uh, the event back over to Felicia, who will provide an opportunity of FTA's current funding programs, policies, and resources to support uh, greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Thanks so much to you all. Thank you, Andrew. As Noria noted earlier, the transit industry is already a leader in emissions reduction efforts to help combat climate change. By nature, transit provides millions of Americans with a sustainable transportation option, and as a result, reduces vehicle miles traveled. FTA is committed to working with public, with public transportation providers to strengthen their efforts and abilities to implement strategies in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. FTA's grant programs, technical assistance, research and policy programs all play a role in the agency's effort to address climate change. Most of FTA's funding programs include eligibility for electric vehicle, infrastructure, and vehicles for public transportation agency fleets, battery electric buses, and hydrogen fuel cell buses and related infrastructure can be considered as an eligible expense under many of FTA's capital programs. Our low or no emission program specifically targets EV fleet conversion and use of other low or no emission technologies. Since 2016, FTA, FTA has provided over 400 million to state and local governments to purchase or lease zero or low emission transit buses and to fund supporting facilities. Energy efficient designs or Convert conservation elements are also eligible element expenses under many grant programs, such as buses, buses and bus facilities and capital investment grants. In addition to our funding programs, FTA has developed tools, sponsored research projects, and provided training and technical assistance. For example, our user-friendly greenhouse gas emissions estimator tool that allows users to estimate project-specific greenhouse gas emissions for their analysis under the National Environmental Policy Act. The tool can be used to assess the partial life cycle greenhouse gas emissions associated with the construction, operation, and maintenance phases of various trans transit modes. The Environmental and Sustainability Sustainability Management Systems Program provides training and technical assistance to transit agencies to develop and implement practices to reduce environmental impacts and to increase operational efficiency. Transit agencies from across the country have participated in this program and developed their own ESMS. And we recently released a guidebook sharing best practices that other agencies can follow, follow to develop their own ESMS. FTA also sponsors research and demonstration projects to, to promote the development and implementation of energy efficiency enhancing technologies for buses. Advanced technologies recently demonstrated through the Bus Efficiency Enhancement Research and Demonstrations Program includes a reduced engine idle load system, a thermoelectric generator, 
and a hybrid beltless alternator retrofit project. FTA has several programs that support testing and evaluation of low or no emission vehicle components. Our Integrated Mobility Innovation, or IMI program, funds projects that use innovative technologies and processes to improve access to public transportation, enhance transportation efficiency and effectiveness. These efforts encourage ridership and consequently reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That was a snapshot of FTA's efforts or tools to support public transit agencies re with reducing gre their greenhouse gas emissions. We also did a quick poll during registration to see how many transit agencies have climate action plans. As of noon yesterday, 38% of the responding public transit providers reported having a climate action plan or a strategic plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Another 37% of respondent agencies reported having a plan either under development or a plan, or they plan to develop one. Thank you to everyone who responded because it provides us with a quick look of where the industry is with regards to these climate or sustainability plans. So now I'd like to introduce today's panelists who will share the, the actions their agencies are taking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The first panelist I'd like to introduce is Ms. Mr. Martin Tompkins, Chief Operating Officer of Antelope Valley Transit Authority in Lancaster, California. Prior to joining ABTA in early 2019, Martin spent more than 33 years in the private sector, based in Los Angeles, where he began his career as a bus operator Martin rose through the ranks in all areas of operations, safety, and training. And over the last 25 years, Martin has served as a general regional manager for two major transportation corporations. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for this opportunity and sharing our electrification journey and efforts in reducing the greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. ABTA is located in Northern LA County, which is 73 miles north of downtown Los Angeles. We were established in 1992. We are a JPA or Joint Powers of Authority. Our board of directors are made up of three cities, the cities of Lancaster, Palmdale, and Los Angeles County. In 2004, we moved into a new facility on 17 acre parcel. We added solar canopies to offset our electricity cost. In 2014, we introduced our first two fully electric vehicles. In 2015, we released an RFP for the purchase of eight additional BYD zero emission buses. In 2016, our board of directors authorized the purchase of 85 new zero emission buses <clears throat> we are the first transit agency in the nation to go electric, fully electric on our local transit services. Today on local transit, we have 57 fully electric buses in revenue service. Our, com our commuter fleet is scheduled to be replaced with 24 45 foot fully electric MCIs. We anticipate taking delivery of these MCIs for these commuter vehicles at the end of this month. Next slide. Our continued journey in 2016, ABTA along with other California agencies were recognized by the White House as part of the West Coast adoption of zero emission vehicles. In 2017, we introduced our first 60 foot articulated local transit vehicle. As mentioned in my previous slide, we have a total today of 13 60 foot articulated vehicles along our heaviest ridership route on our main corridor. In 2017, we completed the installation of three inductive charging wave pads at one of our transit centers. In 2018, we, our facility charging infrastructure was completed, which includes 43 80 kilowatt and 19 200 kilowatt chargers. Also in 2018, we completed the installation of three additional wave charging pads at our second transit center. And as of 2018, 2019, we added two additional transit centers and there are a total of 12 inductive charging wave pads across our four transit centers. In mid 2018 and late 2019, we reached two milestones by logging one and two million electric miles traveled. 
Next slide. In the height of the pandemic, our ridership dropped like many other agencies across the nation, but we managed to operate a critical bus services for, for this community. And in doing so, we logged our third and fourth million electric miles operated in revenue service. In April 27th of this year, AVTA dedicated the Marvin E. Christ Wellness Center, entirely paid for with low, low carbon fuel standard credits earned from AVTA's electric fleet. The Wellness Center is used by all employees in our local Sheriff's Department. And just in the last month, we achieved a huge milestone by logging our, our 5 million electric miles traveled in our local transit services. Next slide. And this, this one here is exciting for us. We just, uh, as we continue to blaze the trail, we purchased an additional 25 acres just behind our facility for the installation and use of a solar field and battery storage. This solar field will, be, will enable us to charge our fleet 100% from solar energy and further reducing our carbon footprint. Next slide. What has been the impact of our 5 million miles traveled? ABTA has saved approximately 1.2 million gallons purchased of diesel fuel, a net savings of $1.6 million in fuel costs after paying for our electricity costs, representing a carbon footprint reduction of more than 30 million pounds of CO2 and a reduction of 72,500 pounds of particulate matter. Total LCF credits monetized, accounting for all credits earned through December 31st, 2020, equals $2.26 million. The approximate value of owned credits earned in quarter, the first quarter of 21 is 390,000 to 450,000. And the estimated value in quarter two of, 20, of 2021 without electricity bills is $400,000. Next slide. Our agency was able to leverage the FTA and the US Department of Transportation in achieving our goals through the awards of two loan grants totaling $6.9 million and a bill grant totaling $8.6 million. And that concludes my presentation. And again, thank you for allowing me to present. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate that. Next up, uh, our next speaker is Randy Clark, President and CEO of Capital Metro, which serves as the public trans transit provider for Austin, Texas and its nearby communities. Randy also serves as the Executive Director for the Austin Transit Partnership, where he oversees the design and implementation of $7.1 billion in transit network expansion program. Prior to his current role, Randy held key leadership positions in public transportation in both Boston and Washington, DC. And he earned his master's degree in public policy from the University of Southern Maine. Under Randy's leadership at Capital Metro, transit ridership reached all time highs following the 2000, 2018 redesign of its bus network, along with multi-million dollar investments to the system and a renewed focus on improving customer experience. Welcome, Randy. We look forward to hearing more about Capital Metro and its emission reduction efforts. Hey, uh, Felicia, thanks for uh, the warm intro and for having me today. I have to start off, of course, with a hearty congratulations to uh, Madam Administrator. I'm so happy for her and it's great that we have a confirmed administrator for the FTA, and there can't be one better right now than Nuria uh, running the FTA. So congratulations to you, Nuria, and uh, to the whole industry, quite frankly. So uh, thanks for having me, FTA, a uh, great partner. Uh, I'll take a quick moment and just highlight a couple aspects of Cap Metro. We are in Austin, Texas. Uh, people may have heard Austin may be uh, one of the boom towns of America right now. We're estimated about 150 people a day are moving to the Austin area. We have more tower cranes than I can count, and uh, it's also 100 degrees here today. So if I keep mentioning 100 degrees, maybe it will stop the, uh, the flow of people moving here as fast every day. Um, but it's an amazing opportunity and time we're having here in Austin. 
Uh, Austin is uh, currently our service areas of a 1.3 million. We operate 83 bus routes, a uh, lot of vehicles. Uh, we are kind of the, if you will, the smallest of the large agencies kind of is the best way to describe Austin and then growing very rapidly. Uh, one thing that I think highlights, you know, I won't go through all the slides here uh, on this slide is we also operate freight rail uh, as well. We're one of, one of the only two agencies in the country to do that. And we have a freight partnership that actually generates revenue as a P3 back into the system, kind of a unique model. Um, we also, as, as you mentioned, Felicia, we have a program called Project Connect, which is a very large expansion program. And that includes three new rail lines, two, two of which are light rail, it's about 20 miles of light rail. Part of it will be a subway, uh, several miles of subway in that system. Uh, 25 new stations, one new regional rail line, two new bus rapid transit lines, and an entire new suite of uh, support facilities. So new bus, bus garages and depots, rail facilities, you name it. A uh, very, very large expansion here in this, uh, in this community. And one of the grounding principles and values of the entire program is based on sustainability. And that's why I'm excited to be here today. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, right now we're kind of, you know, we, we were in this little bit of a holding pattern per se, uh, waiting for November to happen, determining on this election if the community was supporting this proposition to move Project Connect forward. And so we, we kind of have a lot of climate uh, planning activities we do and sustainability activities we do, but we want to really create a more holistic sustainability plan. And we kind of had to wait for that decision to say, are we going to be A or v, B in that, in that uh, branch in the road? And we're luckily going down the branch of a big expansion. So right now we're in development of our kind of sustainability vision plan. That's not going to be just the expansion, but also our current process and how we work. Our goal is to be one off, if not the first leaders to be a fully carbon neutral transit agency. And uh, we're doing that in a, in a, in a multiple ways, but the first step will be in FY 22, uh, we're going to the budget process now, we, looking to lock in a sustainability capital fund. So the first for this agency. So, uh, you know, an actual set aside that we can target actionable things each year to become more sustainable. And it could be energy focused, it could be water focused, could be a variety of things that actually overall make us uh, a better steward of, of this planet. Uh, let's just quick talk, talk about uh, a fleet electrification. That's obviously the, the most uh, uh, highlighted topic here today. So we are aggressively moving toward a zero emission vehicle transition plan. Uh, we have 12 vehicles in service now. We had the first 60 foot electric vehicle in Texas put into service here. We have uh, vehicles from uh, multiple manufacturers uh, and suppliers. And we were the first agency to ever interoperably charge uh, a so we actually charged a Proterra vehicle with a new flyer uh, charging system and a new flyer with a Proterra charging system. And again, that's a, as agencies, we need to continue to push that program forward because none of us are going to be able to operate as one standard uh, supplier. And so we got to have this interoperability system approach. So we were really trying to lean in on that, uh, on that type of innovation. Uh, we are in a multi-year vehicle procurement process right now. Look to go to award in uh, the August, September timeframe. Uh, our agency basically is committed to never buying a, a, another bus that is not zero emission. So uh, we are really aggressively moving forward in that. In the last two years, we stood up an entire electric uh, bus depot charging yard. Uh, the next step now is to canopy that and do solar on it. And we, and we have funding and we're gonna be moving that forward. But right now we can charge all of our electric vehicles. Uh, we knocked down an old warehouse, remediate the site, bought 12 electric vehicles and got all the electric charging put up and, all, and did all that in two years. So really proud of the team for their very uh, hard work on that. We're also obviously integrating everything we do in our expansion rail program or, or demand response paratransit fleets, all will be uh, zero emission as well. And then one of the unique things I just want to quickly highlight is we are really aggressively working on our e-bike program. And so between the city of Austin and Cap Metro, we have a program called Metro Bike. And uh, we are actually quickly trying to expand that. Right now we have about a thousand bikes and we want to double that. We want to really expand it throughout the community. I'm a big believer someone on an electric bike is as good as someone on a transit bus. So the idea of getting someone out of a car by themselves sitting in traffic and uh, doing environmental damage, if you will, is a lot better 
um, if we can get people on, on, on alternative modes. We have 100% integrated ticketing between bike and rail and bus now. So kind of a, a fun thing if you ever find yourself in Austin. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing I'm really proud of is the team has worked and we are now 100% renewable energy uh, source power. So all of our facilities are 100% renewable and we work closely with Austin Energy who is, it's actually unique here. Our, our municipality owns the uh, electrical utility and they, they have a quick goal to get 100% or 80% renewables as well. So we work very closely with them and we're 100% renewable. We also have a lot of our facilities powered on solar and we're doing a lot of pilots right now where on bus stops or bus stations we are doing uh, pilots on how to do e-paper signs or security cameras or TVMs, all done with a battery storage pack and a solar panel. We want to A, make streamlined construction, but B, have as much renewable focused and uh, sustainable uh, infrastructure that has low maintenance. And we're doing all that obviously to further reduce our operating expenses. I mentioned Project Connect, we're focused on vehicles, facilities. Uh, other things we're focused on though are our right-of-way how do we make our right of way as green as possible? How do we think of things about trees and shade? Like I mentioned, it's 100 degrees here today. Uh, trees are very important. And in a Texas, and I didn't know this before I got to Texas, water management is beyond critical. Uh, it won't rain for a long time and then it rains four inches in like uh, 40 minutes. And so water management for us as a system and as a community is incredibly important. So we're working on all of that facility, battery, uh, storage, on-site renewables. We wanna really help focus on vehicle to grid and microgrids. Texas went through a really bad emergency situation in February where most of the state lost power. And uh, you know we need to be able to take our buses and then go to a senior center and charge them up as much as we need to be able to run sustainably as well. So kind of innovation across all ends. So I think that uh, probably covers where we are, Felicia, right now. We're trying to do a lot of things, trying to keep up with people like Martin and Stephanie and others that are uh, doing a great job around the industry. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate that. Our next speaker is Stephanie Wiggins, CEO of LA Metro in Los Angeles, California. Stephanie stepped into that role just this month, becoming the first woman and the first African-American woman to lead LA Metro. Congratulations, Stephanie. Prior to her appointment as CEO, she served as the CEO of Metrolink in Southern California, where she managed a bud budget of $793 million and 282 full-time employees, and impressively led the development of an insight-driven recovery plan to reimagine the delivery of service in a post-COVID-19 environment. No stranger to LA Metro, Stephanie also previously served as its deputy CEO, its executive director of vendor and contract management, and its executive officer and project director of the Congestion Reduction and Express Lanes Program, where she, where she launched LA County's first high occupancy lane, toll lanes. Stephanie has had a robust and influential career over the years, and we are happy to have her joining us today. Thank you, Stephanie, and congratulations again. Well, thank you so much, Felicia. Um, first, I want to join the chorus of congratulations uh, for Administrator Fernandez. Um, it is so well-deserved. We are so excited, as Randy said, have, as an industry, particularly because she was the preeminent chair of, for all of us through APTA and steering us um, through uh, the pandemic. So again, much congratulations to her as well. Um, I also will say, Randy, while we don't have 100 degrees right now in LA, we are under an extreme heat warning. I mean, it is ridiculous. So it's just appropriate. And I thank uh, the administrator and Felicia for the invitation to speak to you today on this very important, uh, important topic. Um, it is a privilege to be on this panel with Martin, uh, my partner in North County of Los Angeles County and uh, Randy and Kim. So as I speak to you today briefly about our initiatives at LA Metro, most of which have been developed for over a decade that benefit investments in our system, our people and our community. I wanna note that while our program has become mature, we continually look 
for opportunities to create innovation and new paradigm shifts. Next slide. You know the crisis climate is real. Uh, Metro has been working on innovation and programs to address the climate crisis within our region since 2007. Our first sustainability strategic plan was developed in 2008. And so the world has evolved since the publication, uh, Felicia, of our first climate action plan in 2012. Uh, but we now have better science to identify the impacts of climate to our infrastructure. Technology has become more readily available for us to produce and store renewable energy. And our tools and methods to incorporate sustainable and resilient strategies at the earliest stages of our planning process have been developed and improved. So our 2019 Climate Action and Adaptation Plan, as well as our 10-year Sustainability Strategic Plan, outline the most comprehensive and most innovative strategies we are employing to fight climate change in our region. Next slide. But I wanna um, start by setting the stage first. Um, the administrator has already acknowledged how the transportation sector is the largest source of GHG emissions. So at Metro, at LA Metro, we're about 81% of our total emissions are from our operations. And emissions from our directly operated and purchased transportation are about 63% of our total emissions. So it's been important for us to focus our climate action and adaptation activities on addressing the biggest source of our emissions while simultaneously addressing the other sources of emissions within our control and those that we can influence in our region. Next slide. So our GHG emissions are only one part of our story. Uh, our projects and programs we fund benefit the mobility of our region. And we are using the APTA quantifying greenhouse gas emissions from transit protocol to demonstrate how our investments are actually displacing more GHG emissions than we are emitting. And the chart to the right of the slide, we show that as our investments in our transportation system grow over time, the net GHG benefit from those investments also grow over time. Another way of looking at this is that in the absence of the transit investments we are making within LA County, the GHG emissions of our region would have been almost 4% higher. Next slide. We're not stopping there. We wanna reduce our internal GHG emissions. Our agency's goal is very ambitious. Um, through our actions uh, that are outlined in our latest plan, we want to reduce about 80% of our GHG emissions compared to our 2017 numbers by 2030. And then continuing on that path, our goal is to be uh, a net zero GHG emissions agency by 2050. So the 13 strategies that are shown to the right of this slide will bring us to those 2030 and 2050 goals. And I do wanna note that the first four strategies on the slide relate to the transit and vehicle emissions reductions, where we get the biggest bang for our buck. The next three are related to energy and the rest are related to our facility operations. Um, and as it relates to our energy strategy, we plan to produce as much renewable energy as possible within our own properties as the utilities upon whom we depend on for propulsion power and um, our electricity to our facilities, they are tapping more into renewable energy sources as well. Next slide. Um, one of the things that transit agencies have to grapple with and uh, LA Metro has as well, is what is the cost benefit of investing in reducing your greenhouse gas emissions? And so um, we developed some current models working with our consultant team, and we identified that it will cost us approximately a net, a net of $119 million of capital and operations costs to build up our overall portfolio of GHG reduction strategies. So through a combination of operational adjustments, financial optimization and model corrections and alternative delivery methods, uh, all of which uh, we analyzed to look for cost savings, revenue generation, as well as the ability to improve on our efficiency of our project planning, delivery and operations, 
we found cost efficiencies of up to $273 million. So for us, that means if we implement these initiatives well, we expect not a sunk cost of 119 million in capital investments by the end of this decade, but rather we expect to recover all of our capital costs and come out with a net positive fiscal benefit of $155 million. So bottom line, sustainability and resiliency strategies are worth the investment made. Next slide. This is just highlighting a few of the examples of our best practices. Um, obviously for every transit agency, you have to look at your fleet. We are no different. Um, in the opening, there was a talk, I think Felicia mentioned the FTA grants on EMS, environmental management system. I wanna spend a moment as I uh, close to talk about how impactful it has been for us to actually um, really empower our workforce as part of our strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. So we developed a growing a greener workforce program. It is having a tangible effect on how Metro does business. Uh, we provide courses on G Pro building skills training, et cetera. And it has been effective at transforming all of Metro's employees into agents for change and spreading sustainable ideas across the agency. One example of how this program has been effective at embedding sustainability in departments across the agency comes from our very own communications department. Uh, one of our staff who is from the communications team and completed the course actually identified an opportunity to conserve water through their design work. So on the slide, there's a donut sign at our North Hollywood station. It was redesigned to minimize dust and dirt accumulation, which reduces water uses for cleaning and maintenance labor. Again, I think my, my takeaway here is to really have sustainable change in reducing our GHG emissions. We need every one of our 11,000 employees to understand the role they can play, not only in sustainability, but how we can reduce our impact to the climate. Next slide. So I want to just conclude with um, some following thoughts for your consideration. You know, this pandemic is more than a momentary crisis. It truly is a disruption. And we know that with our new administration and the new FTA leadership, there is an even greater sense of urgency as it relates uh, to climate change. Uh, we're recognizing at LA Metro that our baseline conditions have changed. Um, so in the spirit of continual improvement, I'm working with our board and our staff for us to rethink our overall strategies, including those of GHG emissions reductions I've outlined here today. We're also considering operational adjustments due to, due to our continuing structural deficit. We are reinventing our service for better customer service and user experience and to continue to be safe. We're also looking at the operational challenges uh, that I outlined in this third major bullet on this slide, you know, the, um, the scope and scale that we have at LA Metro to try to convert over 2,000 buses to zero emission and um, all of the infrastructure that comes with that our divisions. Right now, we're estimating at about a $3 billion uh, financial program or financial need to make that happen. So, um, you know, we will continue with our audacious and bold goals. Um, we've invested significantly in our workforce in the past decade. Our Growing a Greener Workforce Initiative created environmental and climate leaders within our own workforce and our communities. And we will continue our collaboration with these leaders to ensure that this decade of action becomes the decade of climate action. Next slide. So that completes my presentation. You can learn more about what I've shared here today at metro.net slash sustainability. And I look forward to the continuing dialogue. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie. We really appreciate you providing that presentation. Um, our next speaker is Kim Felstead, Transit Manager at Park City Transit, the primary public transit system in the Park City, Utah region providing bus and paratransit services to more than 3 million residents, visitors, 
athletes and employees annually. As its transit manager, Kim is committed to making Park City Transit a key player in the city's own ambitious sustainability goals. Kim earned a master's degree in human resources management from Utah State University, and her career in public transit spans more than 15 years. She's begun her career at Utah Transit Authority, where she held roles in labor relations, bus operations, and light rail operations. Welcome, Kim, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I appreciate this opportunity. Thanks to everyone that's taken the time out of their day to listen to our uh, little spiel about our rural transit agency here. I'm kind of a small player in this pond today. <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone's had the pleasure to visit Park City, Utah, but it is a beautiful place to visit. Uh, we are just 25 minutes outside of Salt Lake City. Uh, we were host to the 2002 Olympics, which definitely caused some growth within our little town. Uh, you know, annually we have 8,500 residents that reside here. But we somehow transport, you know, 2.83 million people a year pre-pandemic. And that is because we get a lot of visitors to this beautiful area that come to enjoy our mountains, the hiking, the biking, and of course the skiing. Um, we see a lot of second homeowners uh, that have homes here to enjoy the seasons of Park City. And we are fortunate enough to be supported by the property taxes that come from that opportunity. So our little system has always been fare free. Um, Park City originally started as a mining town and they were mining silver here. Uh, and then in the 70s, it started to come back as a ski destination and really has had tremendous growth ever since the Olympics. And we are home to three major resorts, Park City Mountain Resort, Canyons, those are both Bell properties. And then we have Deer Valley, of course. So we often transport a lot of tourists and skiers on our buses. Uh, in 2006, Park City decided to go into a partnership with Summit County and start serving the greater Summit County area. Uh, so that really caused a lot of growth for our little transit agency. And we expanded our boundaries outside of the city. And the need just continues to grow as you know, the population is growing in this area and the housing. But because of that, we are now going through an exercise where we're gonna actually be separating from the county service come July 1st. They have formed their own new regional transit authority and the city still is interested in just focusing on Park City and making sure our residents have their interests met when it comes to transit. So we're separating assets, um, but that is not stopping us from continuing with our very aggressive goal to be all electric by 2030 for our bus fleet. So Park City is definitely a town that loves bold innovation and the residents are very supportive of their public transit system, which has been very nice to have that public support um, behind this huge effort. You go to the next slide, please. So it's just part of our culture that, you know, we're very committed to the environment and sustainability. Um, it's not really a hard sell here in Park City, the residents, want to ensure that this beautiful place is around for years to come and that we're not hurting our climate um, in the process of making sure people can enjoy our mountains. So, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting mix here. You know, we certainly have our transit dependent that come in to town to work at the ski resorts and so forth, but you will also have um, millionaires basically riding your system because they believe in taking cars off the road and doing what's best for the environment. So. We have a very diverse mix of people that ride our buses every day. Um, so, you know, as far as importance, uh, where transit falls in Park City, obviously bus transit is very important, but we are actually fall behind walking and bicycling. That is the top primary important modes of transportation in Park City as far as the city's um, goals and aspirations. We have solar powered facilities, we are working to preserve our open spaces. And um, obviously transit is a huge part of that effort. Okay, if you go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So we are funded by several different means. Um, obviously we do get to receive some federal funds because as a rural agency, we work with the Utah Department of Transportation to receive those funds. And that has been pretty beneficial for Park City. Um, I anticipate that that is going to change here in the new 
your future because now we'll have the county as an additional rural player uh, competing for those funds. And the other rural agencies across the state are now starting to venture into electric. We were the first and um, we're not really competing with anyone for some of these Lono grants. So um, I think that that's just going to become a little bit more difficult as time goes on. And we also are funded by local tax dollars. There's a lot of taxes that were passed locally to support transit. And that has given us a good base to work from. But obviously, with the pandemic, you know, that has suffered uh, a little bit. And so certainly appreciated of the CARES funds um, that have been available to help public transportation. And um, we started down this venture of doing electric buses in 2016. So I've only been at Park City for a year and a half. It was my predecessors that started this very aggressive effort. And that was when they received their first Lono grant for 3.9 million. So Park City purchased um, six short range Proterra buses at that time. And then we received another Lono in 2018 for 2.29 million where seven Proterra long range buses were purchased along with two overhead chargers and nine depot chargers. So our fleet currently consists of all Proterras, 13 of them, but we are entering into um, a combined purchase with the Utah Transit Authority to get uh, Gillig electric buses. So we will have two charger systems and two fleets here in 2022. And that's basically it. Thank you for this opportunity. All right, well, thank you to all of our panelists today. It was great to learn about the critical work that your agencies are doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and in taking the lead on climate initiatives. I do look forward to to learning a bit more uh, from you all as we move into a roundtable discussion, because um, we do have a handful of questions for, for each of you. The first question is for the entire panel, and I would like to start with you, Kim, if that's fine. All right. Your agencies have been ahead of the curve. What was the main driver or motivation for your agency to pursue your climate initiatives when you did? So basically, it's the culture that exist in Park City. Um, we have just two highways that come into town and they're two lane roads. And so that generates a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic congestion and a lot of idling uh, in our busy season. So because of Park City's commitment to the environment, they wanted to pursue this effort across the city of having renewable energy, but obviously our bus fleet was kind of one of the most aggressive ways we could obtain that uh, faster. And so that has been a focus and a priority for the city, just because that is what the citizens of the city want and support. All right, thank you. Um, I'll turn to Randy, if you'd like to add in on that. Yeah, I, honestly, I'll, I'll follow Kim's a little bit and I've been on Kim's system, it's fantastic. It's a beautiful area and it's uh, very well run. So kudos to you, Kim. Um, I think it's culture as well. Uh, Austin has this, I, I would say, Three, three values that are all kind of mixing into our kind of plans, but holistic in the community. And that's innovation. We're kind of, uh, you know, I jokingly would say this, I guess to Nuria, if she still had her old role, but we're like the new Silicon Valley. Uh, so very tech focused, very into innovation. Uh, Austin has historically been known as one of the more climate sensitive areas of Texas, very into conservation, water management. It's very green. Uh, but the other part is equity and really talking about the equity aspect of climate that I think is lost a lot of times in the conversation. And Austin has a very deep historical issues with equity on a 1928 uh, kind of segregation zoning uh, plan. And you know whether it's asthma or other health related impacts to vehicles and emissions, I think a lot of people in our community are realizing and, and, and voting quite frankly to invest in cleaner energy and cleaner transportation because they know it has been disproportionately impacted to, to those underrepresented or underserved in our community. So I kind of took all three of those values, I think is why we as a community are pushing on this program so hard, both at transit and holistically at the uh, utilities. All right, great, thank you. Um, well, we'll ask Stephanie to, to chime in on this question next. Sure, I think part of our culture in LA County is that um, at least our portion of LA County has been a non-attainment area for air quality 
for quite some time. And so when you think about the impacts on asthma for children, the impacts of climate on, um, you know, nowadays we have these wildfires, et cetera. Our board um, for at least a couple of decades has wanted to be a leader in this area. Um, we, we have an urgency related to that. So that's been a, been a driver. And um, quite honestly, it costs a lot of money to operate our transit system. So it was important that it was good for business as well. And the fact that for our, for our improvements and initiatives, we've generated almost $100 million in new revenue as a result of some of our climate initiatives, greening our system um, that improve the life cycle of our operations. And we want to do more of that. But those are the, the key drivers. Thank you, Martin. Why don't we hear from you? I was on mute there, sorry. <laughs> Before I answer the question, I also like to extend my sincere congratulations to uh, Madam Administrator Fernandez. Congratulations, we look forward to your leadership. Um, with that, I, it was part of, is part of the culture as well, but it was also the direction of our visionary uh, board members, our board leaders. Um, they had a vision for this agency and uh, they set out for us to be the pioneers in reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, here in the Antelope Valley. Uh, I mean, think of it, 30 million pounds of CO2 and 72,000 pounds of particulate matter reduced, I believe is a huge start. And, uh, you know, we're just a small agency. So I think of the times when other agencies across the nation will become part of the ZEP community and uh, the impact uh, will be unthinkable. I mean, it's, uh, I believe our future ahead of us as a transit community is, uh, looks very bright, so. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, we do have another question. And Martin, I'm actually going to stay with you for this next one. Uh, what are some of the challenges that you are hearing about or experiencing from the transit providers that serve rural areas? That's a great question. Well, we we are the service providers in the rural areas. Uh, we currently operate uh, three 40 foot buses along three routes and we operate on two hour headways and ridership is very low. Uh, we're averaging two to three trips, uh, two to three riders per trip, which is, which is, it's not a good way to spend our resources. Um, some of the challenges in the rural areas uh, for big buses will centralize charging or covering the distances uh, between uh, the communities with no charging capabilities. So we looked at other, uh, avenues and other areas to increase our efficiencies with uh, smaller electric vehicles. Uh, the installation of, we looked at, or we're looking at the installation of new charging, plug-in chargers in the central rural area, uh, a hub for those vehicles uh, with plug-in chargers. So we implemented a pilot, uh, pilot microtransit program last year in September. And we began operating microtransit in parallel with our current fixed route service. Um, we put into service eight fully electric vans, and to date, to date the results have been uh, very promising. Um, in the first month of the program uh, in September last year, we saw a small number of riders uh, on uh, using the system. And to date, I'm, I'm happy to say that uh, the ridership has been steadily increasing and I'm happy to report that uh, we have an average of 4,400 uh, passengers per month using a market transit. So I believe we tapped into not only a new group of riders, but some of our riders on that uh, 50, 51, 52 routes are migrating onto our micro transit system. And that's, uh, we reduced the, the, uh, the wait time uh, from two hours for every, every bus to approximately 30 minutes when you call a micro transit, micro transit vehicle. Wow, okay, thank you. Um, I'll also uh, take this opportunity to turn this also, also over to Kim. Uh, I'd like to hear from you what challenges uh, that you've been hearing about or experiencing uh, as a provider serving a rural community. Uh, yes, I've been experiencing some challenges firsthand as a provider in a rural community. Um, I think you know one of the main challenges, of course, is funding um, to go all electric costs a lot of money, but as part of the city government, uh, you know, we share our resources here. So the folks that are responsible for fleet maintenance are also responsible for our police cars and our snow plows. And, 
um, have to really have a, a diverse set of skills when you introduce an electric fleet into that mix. And they certainly have done a great job rising to the challenge and learning a lot of new things, but it has been a bumpy start for us. Um, you know, we had first generation technology with the first wave of Proterra's. And we still are working through a lot of mechanical issues and charger issues. And, you know, having worked at the Utah Transit Authority prior to this, um, you know, we had a huge fleet maintenance department and we had specialists, you know, that could be dedicated to certain tasks where in a rural agency, you have to kind of do it all yourself. And, and so I think they've actually done an amazing job for being so small and implementing this technology. And, and what I've seen from the other role for providers, now they're entering into this field, um, but it's probably even harder for them because you know often they're very small and the person that's trying to initiate the new efforts and, and run the operations is also operating a bus for part of their day. So um, I feel fortunate I do have the resources I have, but uh, it has definitely been a challenge for our size. Okay. No problem, not on mute. All right, well, thank you both for, for uh, taking that question from me. Uh, Kim, I'm, I'm curious as to what challenges, uh, to build on the challenges you were talking about, are, are you facing impacts for your ability to do more in navigating not just those challenges, but there may be other challenges that we may not be aware of that you could also be facing that even prevents you from going beyond uh, the goals that you are your, your transit agency has currently identified? Um, I think, you know, part of one of the challenges is that we are separating from the county right now. So that has kind of maybe put our, our goal of going all electric a little bit back from what we had originally assumed would happen because we are going to share our electric fleet with them eventually and, and support their effort to go all electric, but they are expanding out further into the county and going to start partnering with other counties uh, in the area. So I don't know that that was anticipated when we initially went down this path, um, but we're still very dedicated to reaching our goal. So, you know, if it really boils down to funding opportunities and support to train um, the skill set that is needed to maintain these fleets, you know, you're, you're kind of grooming your mechanics from scratch at least we have been in Park City. So um, I think that's been some of the hardest things. And then our climate, uh, you know, with the cold weather, the snow, the electric buses have not performed as we initially thought they would. We've had charging issues when it snows. Um, you know, the heater use definitely drains the batteries a lot quicker than originally anticipated. So uh, we're looking at you know, by 2024, our first wave of buses are going to have 500,000 miles on them. And so we're very aggressive in using them, but we do a lot to keep them on the road daily. And we're seeing that basically for every two diesel buses, or, or for basically every diesel bus we would have used, we need two electrics right now. And we're hoping that with the next wave, with the technology improvements, with our staff learning more, um, that that will change and eventually we'll get to the same ratio, but we're just not there yet. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, you, you pointed out some interesting things. So uh, we'll, we'll definitely be taking that back um, as we consider some of the future conversations we'll have. Um, so now I'd like to uh, turn to Randy and ask, uh, what advice would you give to transit agencies that are starting to consider transitioning their fleets to electric fleets or including greenhouse gas emissions reduction measures in project development and operation plans. And any lessons learned you can share, you can add that as well. Yeah, great question. So I think uh, one, you know, I think Kim highlighted the vehicle side of the equation, but the infrastructure side of the equation, quite frankly, is probably the most complex. Uh, we got some great manufacturers in this industry and they're all working hard and an electric vehicle today is a lot better than it was five years ago that's for sure uh, with that said electric vehicles only as good as the ability to charge an electric vehicle and reliably have it on the street and so your partnerships with your utilities are absolutely critical we're very lucky austin energy you really couldn't ask for a better partner uh, it's part of their mission statement to help us basically and so it's, it's working really well but i can't overemphasize to anyone out there 
you got to start with your utility early in the process. Don't just think you're buying vehicles because um, then you're going to become portable chargers. So that is a crucial. Um, you know, you got to have some staff that really believes in this and wants to push innovation. You got to have a great partner like the FTA that wants to help fund some stuff. We've been very lucky to get some low no over a couple of years. Thank you to FTA. Uh, a group that sometimes is missing is doesn't get enough highlight though. That I'll just take a second is it's your frontline staff and the, your union. So we've been really working. Uh, one of the most important things we do here is build a relationship with the ATU. And because we cannot do anything in our world and in, in transit world without our staff. And so, you know, it is moving someone's cheese as someone in our organization likes to say all the time to go from a diesel bus to a <coughs> bus. And whether it's safety aspects or technical maintenance, you name it, we have to make sure our workforce feels comfortable that their training and their proficiency at that equipment is, is forefront in our planning and us working with them. Because without that, you can have great infrastructure, great vehicles, doesn't again get out the street. And ultimately, these are the individuals, you know, I used to work for someone that used to say, people like me, unfortunately, can come and go, but the workforce is the bread and butter that makes these uh, agencies happen. And we got to make sure that they are trained and part of the process uh, to you know bus procurements, infrastructure and training to move things forward. So partnership, 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 as uh, some of us always say, is the key. All right. Thank you, Randy, for that. Uh, that's interesting take on it, but you're right. Partnership is key to, to success in anything. Um, Martin, would you like to jump in on this and give some advice uh, on this question as well? Sure. I mean, and I will echo a lot of what uh, Randy's mentioned already. It's, you know, working with your, your local utility uh, representatives, because there is a lot of planning that goes into your infrastructure, um, charging opportunities in your service area. You know, as, as, as I previously mentioned, we, we have four transit centers and, and Early on, we you know we built in those charging pads, and and you know to date they've been very very successful. We've been very successful with our with our routing, and building time into those uh, into those transit centers, and and gaining charging opportunity on every trip. So, um, in addition, uh, what we saw early on, a uh, piece of what Randy said as well as training. Uh, you know, making sure your technicians are trained, but the operators. We saw early on that uh, what we called it range anxiety. Uh, where operators were, were, you know, they, they get to 40% state of charge and they were calling in saying my bus is going to shut down. So making sure your operators are, are, are properly trained is, uh, is a big piece of this puzzle. And, you know, making sure they do understand, um, you know, the capabilities of a vehicle, what one electric vehicle does, you know, when you get down to 40% state of charge or 20% state of charge is not just going to shut down on you. So, um, and also making sure that the operators don't, miss that opportunity charge that's built into their into their schedules um that's that's very important and you know and don't underestimate the uh, the challenges of charging um you know in the end it was estimated that our project would be five to ten years before we had a full build out um you know we took the all hands on deck attitude uh, it's been seven years uh we have 57 uh, fully electric vehicles in service and we're really proud of that uh, uh, there's been some challenges along the way but we we've learned to to deal with those challenges and um, and find new ways of doing things. So, um, yeah, with that, uh, and one last piece is that with our vehicles, with our fully uh, electric local transit fleet, uh, which is what we're proud of, uh, we also are going to receive our our commuter coaches here at the end of the year. So, I believe uh, at the end of this year, start of 2022, uh, we're going to sit back and say that we are fully 100% electric across our service area. So we're really proud of that at AVTA. Well, we, it'll be good to see you get there. So we'll, 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 talk, we'll talk later when that day turns, comes around. Absolutely. And we invite anybody to come uh, to come see our infrastructure and then ask questions and we'll be happy to give you a tour. All right. Thank you for that both to um, Randy and Martin. Now I'd like to turn over to turn to Stephanie. Um, Stephanie, if you could just speak to how FTA can further support transit agencies in reducing their their greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks, Felicia. I'm thinking um, I would like to talk about FTA's role as an influencer. We all know you're a funder, but I do want to talk about an influencer. And um, you know, providing forums like this is very helpful, continuing to do that. Um, I'm not sure who is invited, but I also feel like from LA Metro's perspective, 
it would be helpful if FTA could provide a forum that also invited the manufacturers of these vehicles. So they really understand the importance because um, from a, a agency of our size, we really haven't seen the type of um, cost efficiencies that we'd like to see given our size. And I think the industry is still a little bit hesitant as to whether or not this is really going to be um, a product that actually gets baked into the cake in terms of any transit agency across the country. So um, that's one role of influencing. I think another role of influencing is um, we talk about electric and um, you know we are, we are going down the path of electric, but I think FTA can play a role to really just enforce zero emission and look at all alternative technologies that are proven to be safe and effective um, because that, I think, gives also transit agencies and more manufacturers an opportunity to be part of helping the transit industry and FTA meet our goals uh, aggressively to get our, our, our fleets converted. And I'm sticking on fleets because my assumption is the majority of our um, GHG emissions that we generate comes from our fleet. And then... Um, you know, the other third role of the influencer is knowing that our ridership matters. Because I think for all of us, we all know that it's actually doing the best we can. And um, FTA being a role, playing a role as an influence to, to uplift the importance of ridership and that shift, getting people out of their cars, or as Randy said, any other form of non-driving alone in their car is gonna be, have a huge impact. Um, I would also shamelessly plug, um, uh, working for transit agencies and various boards to get them to think about converting their fleet. FTA can look at, um, you know, what incentives FTA can provide so that transit boards and staff don't just want to wait to the end of the life, uh, life cycle of the rolling stock. They usually use that as a reason not to really want to move forward. And I think um, FTA can play a role in, again, influencing, not necessarily funding, though we'll, we'll take the money, we need the money, but I think influence is very powerful as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, Randy, would you like to chime in on this and share what you think FTA can further do to support transit agencies in reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Yeah, so St I think Stephanie hit, you know, as you know, these panels work, the, Stephanie hit a lot of good, and so I won't maybe repeat those. I'd say maybe two things. One, and part of this is the challenge is what FTA can do within the rules provided by Congress, right? So that's a challenge in our world. Everyone always says, oh, the FTA, but the reality is FTA can only do what legally they can do. So I would say, why don't we just say, in my opinion, the federal government could do, which is continue to incentivize failing forward. And I don't think we do that enough as a country and quite frankly, as an industry. Failing is the only way we get better. And now failing catastrophically is not good, but slight failure is actually how, you know, I don't know, I do a lot of running. You can't get a better runner if you don't run, right? So uh, we have to think about uh, an agency willing to take a little risk and not having public embarrassment because of that and a board feeling like they are vulnerable to public perception. Now that's always gonna be hard in a public world, but I think there's support that FTA could do with that, which is it's giving support to agencies a little bit to say, you failed this way, well, that is good, if you know what I mean. Um, kind of the second thing, I'll take a, maybe a back, you know, more holistic view is not about the vehicles or the facilities. It's quite frankly, us as land use and transportation going hand to hand. And we as a country have a really big challenge in front of us because most of those, most of the emission issues driven in our country are driven by land use, not about transportation. And transportation happens because of a lot of poor product productivity of land use. And so we can put the best electric buses out there and I can run them as high frequency and we can do this, that, and the other. It, do, it doesn't change that we have major zoning and land use issues in America that are non, non, uh, are negative ultimately to climate policy for the future. So I'd love to see Congress holistically think a little bit more tying of grants to how, not just on the FTA side, again, federally, highway, more multimodal. If you are gonna get money from the federal government, 
how are you dealing with climate holistically in your community, not just the silo of say a BRT electric bus program and, you know, and more, more scoring for communities that are willing to tie those uh, nexus together, I think is important long-term in, in America. But that's probably for a long, long, long panel uh, some other day. <laughs> so thanks. No, thank you. Thank you both to Randy and Stephanie for offering their perspective on answering that question. And I wanna take this time to thank all of our uh, speakers today. This does include, conclude our question and answer session. As we heard from our, our speakers, there are many strategies that public transportation agencies can take to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, including both small changes and bold initiatives. I do hope that you can take some of these ideas, identify partners in your community, and adapt what others have done. As we, as we have, have, excuse me, as we all have a role to play in combating climate change and its impact. I would at this time like to turn it back to Administrator Fernandez for some closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Felicia. And I also want to thank all of our panelists and everyone who joined us today. This was excellent. Um, I know that there's always good practices to share, but when those practices are showing uh, some significant benefits and clearly as part of this climate um, action, we are not only welcoming them, but uh, in enjoying and engaging in true partnership. So as I noted earlier, uh, public transportation does play a very key role in helping address the nation's climate uh, change. So I, um, I am very encouraged by all the steps and, and the approaches that you all are taking and that you have shared with us. Uh, our industry is on the right path. There's no question about it. Um, and we can, working together, help meet uh, the, the goals that have been set by the administration. You know, it's through elect electrifying our fleet, using alternative energy sources, as Stephanie noted, uh, as we're also powering the transit facilities. Those are also great solutions. So to get us moving, I am excited to announce FTA's Sustainable Transit for Healthy Planet Challenge. Yes, that's a new thing. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm encouraging all transit agencies to take bold actions and make some meaningful investments so that we can cut this greenhouse gas emissions through a fleet, fleet conversion. So this challenge calls on all transit agencies nationwide. So regardless of size or service area, we want you to participate. And you can do so by developing a climate action tailored to your organization with measurable goals that will help realize tangible GHG emissions reductions. Uh, throughout this year and into the early part of next year, uh, we are going to be providing not only technical assistance, but we're also going to be hosting a series of webinars. So thanks uh, for those of you who suggested that we continue in this format. Uh, and in, in addition to the webinars, there'll be some other tools that will help those who need assistance in developing the climate action plans or any other greenhouse uh, emission reduction strategies that you all will be implementing. The Your Climate Action slash Sustainability Plan will serve as a dashboard so that you can track progress on your reduction measures. Uh, it, you will be able to find more detailed information about the challenge and how to sign up for our, yes, our Sustainable Transit uh, for Healthy Planet Challenge Pledge through FTA's Climate Challenge webpage. So I hope many of you will join us uh, in committing to this very important goal. I think we all want to protect uh, this planet that we live on. And I really look forward to showcasing your successes over the next year. So thanks again uh, for your participation. We have now come to the end of this very informative uh, meeting. And I, again, thanks to all who participated. It's recorded for those who were not able to join us today so that you can watch it at your leisure. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the FTA's Transit Leaders Climate Change Roundtable. We thank you for attending today and please have a wonderful rest of your day.